नमस्ते एंड गुड मॉर्निंग एवरीवन लेट्स स्टार्ट विद अवर रेगुलर प्रेयर्स व्हिच वी डू एंड देन द प्रेयर्स व्हिच आर पार्ट ऑफ दिस उपनिषद ओम गुरु ब्रह्मा गुरु विष्णु गुरु देवो महेश्वर गुरु साक्षात पर ब्रह्म तस्मे श्री गुरुवे नम ओम भूर्भव स्वाहत्सवितरे नय भर्गो देव से धीमहि दियो यो न प्रचोदया अस्तो मा सद्गम्य तम सो मा ज्योतिर्गम्य मृत्युर्मा अमृतम गम्य ओम सहना वबतु सहनो भुनक्तु स वीर्यम करवावै तेजस्वी नावधि तमस्तु मा विद्विषावै ओम शांति 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 ओ so manduki upanishad so let's do the shanti mantra from this upanishad also om bhadram karne bhi shunyam deva bhadram pashye makshi bijatra sthirer angahe tushtvam sansthunu bhi ve ashem dev hitam yadayo swasti na indra ho vrid shravah swasti na pusha vishva deva swasti na takshyo arishta ne bhi swasti न बृहस्पति दधा ओम शांति 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 सुमंडु के उपनिषद वर्स नंबर सेवन एंड दिस वर्सेस आर कॉल्ड व्हाट दिस आर नॉट द श्लोक्स ओके दिस आर नॉट द दोहे और चुपाईस दिस आर नॉट द सूत्रस these are called mantras mantra okay so that's why the rhyming in this one is a little different shlok very easy to rhyme because shlok has four parts two lines so four parts and very rhyming and in hindi also when we look at the dohe and chupai very easy to rhyme easy poetry the mantra sometimes they can be in most of them actually vedic mantras are in poetry but there are prose mantras also so that's why sometimes we see three lines or four lines or two lines or one line okay there is no particular rule is the information is given the knowledge is given through these mantras and mantras were seen by the seers okay so that's why these are called primary scriptures not secondary scriptures they were seen by the seers so in this mantra this mantra number 7 this rishi is trying to tell us what the chatushpad is chatushpad you remember we have been learning what the jagrat avastha is what the swapan avastha is what sushupti avastha is with the help of little examples and little terminology now in this mantra he is trying to tell us the fourth pad okay turiya turiya means actually fourth so fourth so let's look at how he is trying to make us understand what turiya is <clears throat> na antaha pragyam न बहिष प्रज्ञ नो भयता प्रज्ञ न पर्यान घन न प्रज्ञ न अप्रज्ञ अदृष्ट अव्यहार्यम अग्राह्यम अलक्षणम अचिंत्यम अव्यपदेश्यम एक प्रत्यसारम प्रपंचो पशम शांत शिव अद्वैत चतुर्थ मनते स आत्मा स विज्ञेय 
it is not that. So what is not the Turiya? It is not that which is conscious of the internal subjective world. Na antaha pragyam. So it's not that which is conscious of the internal subjective world because we learned about the internal subjective world during our dream state. And that which is conscious of the external world. Nor that which is conscious of both. Ubhyata. Both. Not that which is conscious of both, not that which is a mass of consciousness. Pragyan ghanam. Ghan means a mass. Not that which is a simple consciousness. Nor is it unconscious. Na pragyam, na a pragyam. It is unseen by any sense organ. Not related to anything. Incomprehensible by the mind. Uninferable. Unthinkable. Undescribable. Essentially of the self alone. Negation of all phenomena. The peaceful. Shantam. All bliss. And the non-dual. Advaitam. Over here Shiv word means blissful. This is what is known as the fourth Turiya. This is the Atma. And this is to be realized. Sa Atma, Sa Vigyaya. Not just to know it theoretically, but we have to realize it. If you are writing it, let me read it again. Huh? It's a long definition or the description of this mantra. It is not that which is conscious of the internal subjective world. Nor that which is conscious of the external world. Nor that which is conscious of both. Nor that which is a mass of consciousness. Nor that which is simple consciousness. Nor is it unconscious. It is unseen by any sense organ. Not related to anything. Incomprehensible by the mind. Uninferable. Unthinkable, undescribable, essentially of the self alone. Negation of all phenomena. Parpanchoshamam. The peaceful, all bliss, and the non dual. Shantam, Shivam, Advaitam. This is what is known as the fourth. Chaturtham. This is the Atma. And this is to be realized. Clearly, he is giving us uh, the goal of our life. This is to be realized. That's why we are here. To realize this. The Supreme Being, whether we call it Atma or Paramatma, cannot be described by language. Because language can express itself only by describing the qualities, the properties, the actions, etc. of the object described. Language can do only that much. But in this Chaturtha, <clears throat> there are no qualities, no actions. Substance is in natural sciences described that which has properties. And substances are always finite. No matter how big they are, but they are finite. 
And if we try to describe the supreme reality as having any property, certainly we will be pulling down the infinite to the finite level. The immortal to the base level of mortality. Because any form, no matter how strong it is, by definition, it's not permanent. It's not eternal. It's one difference between the mortal and immortal. Immortal is same no matter what. So the only way by which the fourth or the turiya or the atma can be indicated is by the language of negation. This technique is well adopted in this description by this rishi in this Upanishad, the method of negation. And beautifully, this is quite a famous mantra actually. Nowhere in the literature of philosophy at any time, in any language, has the reality been described so beautifully and so completely. Through the suggestiveness of the words in the language, that's what we see in this poetry. So what do we have over here? In this mantra, we have a cosmic view which points to the ultimate non-dual. So reality through a negation of all things perceived, felt, or thought of. Because we all know that objectified world is perceived by us through our organs of knowledge. Eyes can see, ears can hear. That's how we perceive. And when we use our thoughts and the ideas, we are cognizing them through the instruments of our mind and intellect. So these are like instruments given to us. The entire world which we are aware of, including these very instruments through which we cognize the objects, thoughts, ideas, in our day-to-day -day existence in life, all fall under the category of the world of objects, actually. Not just, sometimes we think only the physical things are objects, no. The ideas also, the thoughts also. But the subject is the eternal factor. Everything else is object. That subject can be called life force or divine spark, soul, self, atma, light, energy, whatever you want to call it. But that is the subject, not the object. It is pure consciousness, pure knowledge. And the only way to show this eternal subject is by negation of all other fields of experiences and the objects experienced in them. We often use the example of the rope in the darkness, may be understood as a serpent or a stick, or even a strip of water, or even as a crack on the surface of the earth. The only way to describe the reality of the rope is to those who are drenched in their illusion, is to negate these misunderstandings. It's not that, it's not that, it's not that. That is a negation. So in almost all the scriptures, uh, this is one of the most used methods by which the eternal is defined. We have seen this Upanishad 
started out with the discussion of human experiences like a four quarters, four parts. So three quarters we have already seen the waking state, the dream state, deep sleep state. So in this mantra, this Rishi is attempting to give a complete and exhaustive description of the fourth quarter, Turiya. So that's why I want to go through this verse, verse by verse with you and describe or at least try to understand what each word really means. Because when this Rishi has come down to explain the fourth state, he has taken all together this very novel idea. And he says subject cannot be cognized, felt or thought by, by these instruments. It's almost like an observer cannot observe himself through the instrument of observation. Okay, like suppose we have a telescope. We are looking through the telescope. We can see far, but we cannot see ourselves. Or often we hear that our own eyes can see the world, but cannot see themselves. The intellect cannot think of the Atma as an object because the moment the intellect is turned completely towards the Atma, the intellect bereft of Atma becomes insentient or inert because it's, it's a prakriti, it's a matter, it's inert, it's a jhad. Atma is the one which is really giving the life to it. So that's why this language of negation Rishi has provided us to understand completely the eternal truth factor in us. Na antaha pragyam. What does it mean? Na antaha pragyam. Not that which is conscious of the internal subjective world. So this Rishi is pointing out to us that Turiya is not the dream. You remember that Tejas has already been described? Tejas was used to understand the world of dream objects. So by negating this, the inner awareness, the Rishi is pointing out to us that Atma or the life force in us is not the dreamer. That's what he means. Na antaha pragyam. Na bahish pragyam. Not that which is conscious of the external world objects. So that really means that this fourth plane of consciousness is not the waking state ego. The Vaishwanar. The waker we have seen is fully aware of the external world of objects. That was the waker. Na ubhyata pragyam. Nor that which is conscious of both. When we negate as we have done the first two phases, both the waking state, dream state, the obvious doubt that would arise in the mind of the disciple would be that the Atma might be a state in between the sleep and the dream. You are conscious slightly of both the outer world and the inner world, you might think that. Because these kind of moments have been lived by almost all of us frequently in between. 
after a heavy lunch sometimes when we are just preparing for our a little quick nap. There could be a misty moment when neither are we fully aware of the external world nor are we totally unconscious of the world of a dreamy world. So this Rishi is negating this also. It's not in between. No pragyan ghanam. Nor that which is a mass of consciousness. So when we have negated the Vaishvanar, the Tejas and the state in between them, the thought could come in our mind that it could be the pragya, the ego in the deep sleep state. But we have already discussed in the previous mantra that pragya is a state in which the entire consciousness of the being is withdrawn from the gross body and the subtle body and the entire lot of it has to come coiled itself up into a homogeneous mass. That's what we learned last week. That's what pragyan ghanam word is. So the expression which we are discussing here for Turiya is negating this also. So basically he says Atma is neither the Jagrat state nor the dream state not the deep sleep state. Na Pragyam that's another word he uses. Nor that which is simple consciousness. Because after looking at all the negation, we might think only possibility in our mind might come. That we must understand that Atma is simple consciousness. But these daring seers of the past the great thinkers of the Hindu philosophy uncompromisingly stood on the platform of their realized knowledge. Because they realized it, that's why they can talk like this. No ruthless logic or sturdy reason. They are declaring very loudly that self in us cannot be described even by the simple term consciousness. That's why I always tell you that this consciousness world, when, when we use it, it depends in which context we are using. <coughs> this is not a simple translation of the Atma when we use the word consciousness. So that's what this Rishi is saying. Na prakyam. This negation is only due to the fact to describe the reality as having a property would be to make the infinite a finite substance. And it's not finite. We cannot use any term for this. So the term consciousness has a meaning only with reference to the opposite quality. You remember in Bhagavad Gita also Lord Krishna said, Neither sat nor sat. The word light is redundant in the sun. The sun knows no darkness at all. So light has no meaning in sun. Because it's only one thing. Sentient can have some sense only in the world where insentience also has a place. So Turiya is the illumination of both the sentient and the insentient. Na apragyam. So he says, nor is it insentient. Na apragyam. So na pragyam, na apragyam. 
So now over here we have a negation of the only proposition possible in the permutation and combination of the possible terms actually. So if all the previously explained five negations be true, then the only loophole through which the finite human intellect could perceive and feel the reality would be through the definition that it must be insentient. If it's not sentient, it must be insentient. So that's why this great master is telling us that Atma is neither awareful of the outer world, nor of the inner world, nor is it conscious of both, nor is it a mess of consciousness, nor is it a simple consciousness. So the only possibility is in that it can be only insentient. So even <laughs> he is negating this too. He says, na aprakyam. It's not insentient. So the definition in the first half of this mantra is trying to negate all the three planes of consciousness generally known to all of us. And he is declaring it that none of the terms or terminologies used in the ordinary language is available in describing the eternal and the immortal. We don't have sophisticated terminology. In the second half of the mantra, <clears throat> this Rishi is trying some positive ideas about the qualities of the Atma. But even over here, we must understand that this positive description is provided through a language of negative assertions. You will see that implication of each term used is so vast so that we can understand it completely, correctly. The knowledge of the real nature of Turiya. So then he uses the word adrishtam. That means unseen. The self is explained here as that which is not seen by the sense organs. Adrishtam. So the term unseen is not only meant that the self has no form. But when we look at this term adrishtam, the implication is negating in it the services of all the other sense organs also. Okay, so not just with the eyes, but adrishtam also means with the our other senses, we cannot comprehend it. Because self is not an object capable of being perceived by any of the five sense organs of knowledge which have been provided to us as human beings. Panch Gyan Indriya. So that means eyes cannot see it, ears cannot hear it, nose cannot smell it, and neither can we touch or taste it. Then next term he uses Avyavaharyam. Not related to anything. By this term, it is indicated that self is an all-pervading factor. It is not related with other things of the world. See, word we are used commonly. Word use is vivhar over here. In the world, all the things and beings have their vivhar. This vivhar is a, like in, with our relationships also, with the things also, with the objects also. So over here he says, a vivhar. Analogy we can use over here to understand it. Analogy of the space. Space is not related with anything. 
Yet no relationship can exist except in space. If there was no space, where the moon and the stars and the earth will be? Space. No reality eternal and immortal is the medium in which all names and forms of the world function in their delusory dealings with one another. Agrahe, incomprehensible. Self cannot be comprehensible by the mind. The mind can comprehend that which is reported to it through any or one or more of the sense organs. So sense organs of our eyes, ears, nose, tongue, skin can perceive only their respective objects of shape, sound, smell, taste and touch. Since the self is not a sense object, since it has no relationship with anything else, it can never be comprehended by the mind. So that's how you should understand that oh, the Aharyam and Agrayam. The next word he used is Alakshanam. Uninferable. If we cannot perceive a thing through direct experience, then ordinarily the other channel we use is inference. Whenever there is fire in the kitchen, we have noticed smoke also. So we have derived a knowledge through our direct perception that wherever there is smoke, there is a fire too. Later on when we see the effect, effect is what? The smoke. We infer and drive the knowledge that there is a fire. Even though we, don't, we are not seeing fire, we are only seeing the dis distant smoky ranges. And we infer. But we cannot infer the divine. That's what he says, oh, Lakshanam. So the inferential knowledge of the existence of fire is arrived because of its effect, which we actually observed, the smoke. So in Sanskrit, it's called Lakshan. But the Atma has no such effects from which we could infer its existence. Self is defined by the great masters of the Upanishad as uninferable. Or then the next big word he uses achintyam. <clears throat> Unthinkable. Chintan we do with our mind. From all this explanation, it's a self-evident that if there's a factor which is unseen, incomprehensible, uninferable then naturally that must certainly be unthinkable. Avyepadeshyam, that means undescribable. So Atma cannot be described. Because we know, we describe the things which are just the expressions of our experiences either through our sense organs or mind or intellect. And the senses and the mind and the intellect, they fall short. They cannot describe. Ave Padeshyam. Ekatmaha Pratyesaram. That is the next word he used 
That means essentially of the nature of the conscious. Because when you are told that all the above negations, we have concluded that the supreme reality is indescribable. But as a student, no matter how intelligent we are, we can feel a little despaired, confused. So this master must have seen this despair and the confusion on the faces of the students. So this master is trying to explain to the students more elaborately the concept of the reality. He says that Atma is of the nature of pure consciousness, pure knowledge. Ek Atma Pratye Saram. Ordinarily in our daily intercourse with life, we gain only knowledge of the things. We know things of the world and the knowledge in us is always conditioned by the objects or thoughts or ideas in us. Either we know of a sound or such other sense perceptions or our feelings or our thoughts but we really don't have the knowledge by which we perceive by which we understand our feelings or by which we know our ideas so that's why this master is insisting the reality is knowledge as such it has no object to qualify it is just a pure awareness and in the light of this awareness, all other sense organs, they go about their routine. Their routine is to illuminate the individual's life. So after negating all the qualities and the qualifications with which we are generally understanding and becoming aware of things in the world of pluralistic objects. He is going to give us some positive qualities of the Atma. He says, Parpancho Shamam. Negation of all the phenomena. The Turiya state is the realm into which the world of finite and its in Perfect, imperfect experiences have no admission. Okay? Pro punch. Punch means five. These five senses, they keep on creating the churning. In the Atma, there is no pro punch. Because it's only up to the gate of Turiya that we have the polarity and the experience of the polarity. Parpanch, which is constituted of the pluralistic world of mortality, is experienced only in the waking state, the dream state, or the deep sleep state. Once a person has transcended these states at Turiya, the worlds of finitude, change, mortality, sorrows, Imperfections, deceits, limitations, and the tears, they have no entry. It's beyond this. So this is what this beautiful word means. Parpanjo shamam. Then he says, shantam, peaceful. Uh, shanti or agitations are caused in us because of our desires, likes and dislikes. Once we have retired from the world of duality into the realm of the self, we are entering the temple of peace. Eternal peace. Perfect actually. That is Turiya. 
Shivam. All bliss, all auspiciousness. That's what Shivam word means. The peaceful is the blissful. Shanti itself is Sukha. Happiness is but the mental condition of poise. And that which is all peaceful must necessarily become all blissful. By definition. And then inauspiciousness can come only in the world of polarity. So that's why only way you can signify the Turiya state is by the term of auspiciousness. There's nothing in auspicious in it. Then he says, Advaitam non-dual. The one without a second. The reality of that rope only exists. The world of duality is available for our experiences only in the worlds of waking and the deep or the dream state. Because in the deep sleep state also, in fact, an experience of something homogenous is there. He explained it to us. We are not aware of it at the time of experiencing it. But when we are in the zone of Turiya, the entire pluralistic world rolls away. The experience of the non-duality or non-dual reality alone remains as eternally true. Then he says, this is what is known as Turiya. I mean, you can see that how glorious this definition of reality, this Rishi has given it to us. It does not define directly, but it has accomplished the function through the technique of negation. So he has negated the world of objects within ourselves into a state away from the waking dream and deep sleep. And he says, this then is the Atma. So indicating Atma as an object, the Guru insists upon his disciple. And it is to be realized. Because in case the students think that, no, now we have found another object, Atma. He says, no, <laughs> you have to realize this. The significance of concluding words of this master is very deep and sacred, actually. After all these elaborate attempts to arrive at a satisfactory definition of the supreme reality, he is saying, basically, what you have now understood intellectually is not in itself the fulfillment of his scriptural studies. Don't think that you know it now. The scriptures are to be understood through reflection, which is called manan. But deeper understanding through the reflection, but that itself is not end. We got to go a step further. That's how this Brahma Vidya is supposed to be understood. So in the end, every student should accomplish the feat of detaching himself from the outer layers. Only then we can rediscover ourselves. Only then we can understand we are that sacred center in which the subject in us will reveal within. The disciple over here should understand that this experience comes within himself. This truth which is non-dual, which is beyond all the phenomena, 
study is important here, but mere study or mere reflection will not fulfill the goal of life. Those are the steps we need to climb on. But meditation is the royal path to success. Meditation. That's the only way the final glory will come in our spiritual life. It's a pretty deep mantra, a lot of words. I'm sure most of you are already familiar with these terms. But you got a little bit more elaborate definitions of it. I want you to contemplate upon it. But don't stop it there. Try to experience this also. Let's stop it here. With the Shanti Mantra, Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachate Purnasya Purnamadai Purnameva Visheshyate Om Shanti 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 Om. Thank you very much.